Greetings once again. This is Pastor Rob Johnson from Servant's Heart Worship Center in Columbia, Tennessee. And I'd like to thank you for joining us on our YouTube channel where we, where we dig into God's Word and, and allow the Holy Spirit to poke the seed of that Word down deep into the soil of our hearts so that it can take root, begin to grow, and produce fruit in our lives. Today's message is kind of a different message. Uh, when Jesus was making his triumphal entry into Jerusalem, he was coming down the mountain. And the people, we know it as Palm Sunday, the people began to lay their cloaks and palm branches out in front of him. And they began to shout praises to God and hail Jesus as the Messiah and as King. And when the Pharisees heard this, they demanded that Jesus silence and rebuke his followers. And Jesus at that point said something kind of strange. And I always wondered what this meant. Jesus said, if these don't shout praises, then the rocks will cry out. So today I've prepared a message where the rocks are going to cry out. Because some of the most amazing uh, stories in scripture and the amazing spiritual lessons that God has for us in scripture are when rocks or stones are involved. So I've titled today's message, The Rocks Cry Out. And I'm going to share several stories from the Bible where the rocks actually bring us a spiritual message. They actually preach to us. And there are many more. There's too many to mention. I selected a few. So what I'd like you to do, if you can, for your own personal Bible study, is after this message, try to think of or go through your Bible and try to think of as many stories as you can where rocks or stones were involved and where those stones or rocks preached a message or provided a spiritual message. Write them down, share them with your friends. Maybe you can create a Bible study of your own. So thank you once again for joining us. Grab a cup of coffee, sit back and relax as we watch today's message entitled, The Rocks Cry Out. God is truly good. You know, I've had family here for two weeks. I've had family here for two weeks. <laughs> it was good to see my son and his family and my daughter-in-law and little grandson. Um, and they're home and they're probably glad to be home. But I was reading because Caleb was staying in where I do my study and I was having to uh, do things a little differently this week and I kept opening my Bible and I kept getting preached to, how many know that God will use anything? I always say, hey, that'll preach. God will use anything in our lives to bring a spiritual message to you. Anything, everything will preach. And don't think it's the medication, but I've been preached to by roosters. I've been preached to by talking donkeys. I've been preached to by worms. In this, when I read the story about Peter and the rooster, that rooster speaks to me. That rooster sends a message. When you read about Balaam and his stubbornness, that talking donkey preaches to me. And when you read about Jonah and how he ran from God and God finally did everything that God said he was going to do and Jonah's still out moping and God brought a worm into the story. If you don't know it, I'm going to leave you hanging. But that worm preaches to me. So this week, and I know some people, well, that's not very preachery. That's my new word, preachery. That's not very solemn, Pastor Rob, to say strange things will preach to you. But it does everything. This week, I got preached to all week by rocks. Rocks talk to me all week long. I'd be out in the garden, they'd be, hey! No, I'm just kidding. Biblical rocks preached to me all week long. Because throughout the Word of God, wherever rocks are mentioned, amazing things happen. If you have your Bibles, let's open them up to Luke 19. We're going to read verses 37 through 40. This is what I referenced earlier. When Jesus was coming down toward the city of Jerusalem on Palm Sunday. People were hailing him as king. And just a week later, they'd be calling for his execution, a lot of them. 
But this is an account of what happened. Look what Jesus says here. Luke 19, 37 through 40 says this. Then, as he was now, see that's weird. Then, as he was now drawing near, the descent of the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of disciples began to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice for all the mighty works they had seen, saying, Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. And some of the Pharisees called to him from the crowd, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. But he answered them and said, I tell you that if these should keep silent, the stones would immediately cry out. Let's pray. Father God, I thank you for your word. I thank you, Father God, for the bread of life. It truly is the bread of life. And I pray, oh God, that everybody in this place and everybody within the sound of my voice this week will have a hunger like never before for your word, that we will all dig into your word like never before, that we would just get in the habit of waking up every single morning before we even have coffee that will come to you in prayer and that will break open your word. So the seed of your word can be put into the soil of our heart before we even start our day. <clears throat> Speak to us through these rocks. I pray this in the name of Jesus. And everybody said? Amen. The Pharisees told Jesus to hush his followers. He told them to rebuke the crowd of people. Not because they were rejoicing too loudly or they were getting too rowdy. They wanted Jesus to rebuke them for what they were saying in their praises to him. They wanted Jesus to rebuke his followers because of the excitement in their voice and how much they loved, how exuberant their praise was and how much they loved Jesus. And Jesus said to the Pharisees, if these keep silent, then the stones will cry out. If God's people don't shout praise, then the rocks will cry out. And I believe that the rocks in the Bible are still crying out to, the, to this day because some of the most dynamic and awesome events in Scripture happen whenever rocks are mentioned. And I believe that these biblical rocks are still crying out. They're still preaching and, and giving their testimonies, teaching us spiritual lessons. So don't ever try to convince me that God can't use you to preach or to teach. Because if God will use a rooster, if God will use a, a, a worm and a talking donkey, and if God will use rocks to preach us spiritual messages, all these thousands of years later, we're still feeding off of them. And they're being, we're being, our lives are being blessed by these messages. If God will use a rock, he can surely use you and I. Can I get an amen on that? Because God has used rocks to preach some incredible things. And I want us to take a look at some of these stories and some of these lessons from these talking rocks in the Bible. The first rock I want to mention is from Genesis chapter 28. It represents a key moment in Jacob's life. Jacob had left Beersheba. And, and if you know the story of Jacob and why he was running and the situation with his brother and he was being hunted down, nothing in his life turned out the way he really wanted it for the first part of his life. So this, at this time, in this, at this scripture, he's, he's at a key point, he's at a crossroads in his life. He was running from a lot of personal um, conflicts, a lot of personal persecutions that he was feeling. And when he came to a good place to stop, it was at a place called Luz, L-U-Z. He was tired because he was literally running. And he came to this place that looked like a safe place to bed down for the night. And he found himself a rock that he used as a pillow. 
And when he laid down and he put his head on that pillow, he fell asleep. And while he was sleeping, God gave him a vision. God gave Jacob a vision that would forever change Jacob's life. It was a dream. It was a vision. Jacob saw angels coming up, going into and coming out of heaven on some sort of a, of a ladder. See, up to this point in his life, his, his life had been largely unfruitful. So God gave him this dream, this vision. And for whatever reason, we may look at it and say, well, he saw a vision of that. How, how did that change his life? See, because God will give us dreams and visions to this day. And sometimes our dream and our vision may not make sense to people around us, but between us and God, we know that the vision was from God. We know that the dream was from God. Sometimes the Lord will even use our children to bring forth messages. God will use anything. And in this case, Jacob had a dream a vision and it recharged his faith for whatever reason he knew at that point that God was speaking directly to him and this dream this vision so touched his life that he decided to take that rock that he would laid his head on the rock that he slept on as he had this dream and he anointed it with oil and he blessed it and he made a monument out of it honoring God's awesome power and then he forever changed the way he lived his life. He not only changed the name of the place, it went from Luz to Bethel. Bethel means the house of God. Sometimes God will take us from, from Luz, Luzerville into the house of God. Sometimes God will take us from the bars or from a lifestyle that isn't godly and he will bring us into the house of God. And Jacob was so touched by this vision that he made a vow to God. And see, vows back then were, had a lot more significance than they do now. A vow back then, when you made a vow to God, your, your life depended on it. You would rather die than to break the vow. Let's look at the vow that Jacob made to God. Genesis 28, let's read 20 through 22. Then Jacob rose early in the morning and he took the stone he had put at his head set it up as a pillar, poured oil on top of it, and he called the name of that place Bethel. But the name of that city had been Luz previously. Then Jacob made a vow saying, if God will be with me and keep me in this way that I am going and give me bread to eat and clothing to put on so that I can, can come back to my father's house in peace, then the Lord shall be my God. And this stone, which I have set as a pillar, shall be God's house. And of all that you give me, I will surely give a tenth to you. So at a time when Jacob was at a major spiritual crossroads in his life, God gave him an anointed vision that forever changed his life. So much so that he made a vow to give the rest of his life, commit it to God completely, wholeheartedly. And he even made a vow to start tithing. He didn't even need any needling from the preacher. He didn't need anything. This vision that God gave him changed his heart and his mind. And he wanted to give praise back to God through his giving. So what is Jacob's rock telling us? What message is Jacob's rock crying out to us today? It's telling us that we serve a God that still gives anointed dreams and visions that can change our life. And he's also telling us that our giving is part of our praise and worship unto God. This scripture really hits home to me and it didn't i never really got it until about six or seven years ago i'd read the story i knew the story by heart i knew god gives dreams and visions i just never really had one and one day i get woken up in the middle of the night by linda and she her eyes were this big and she said i just had a vision from god i said are you sure you weren't dreaming she goes no i was asleep but the lord woke me up and i feel heavy on my heart that he told me to wake you up and tell you 
that we are supposed to start working with kids. And I'm like, kids? What? See, at that time in my life, teaching and being any sort of leader like that, mm, I do music and stuff like that, but I just didn't want any. I said, are you sure, Linda? She goes, oh, no, this is the truth. So the next morning, over coffee, she began to detail out the Lord put on her heart, the vision that God gave her. And she says, I think we're supposed to start working with kids. We're supposed to start a youth group. Her dream was the beginning of JWT. JWT was the beginning of Servant's Heart. See, God used an anointed dream and vision to get me out of my comfort zone and lead me to this place in my life. Doug LaRose had a vision that I was going to be preaching, and I told him, that's not a dream, that's a nightmare. He had a dream that my father had... had uh, uh, called up, called me up and, and handed me his Bible. My dad was preaching and he, he says, I dreamt that he called you up and you walked up and he handed you his Bible and you started preaching. I said, that'll never happen. I was happy in my songwriting mode. And my friend and brother, Brother Doke over there, told me one day, he says, you know what? I think you guys need to start a church. And I'm like, what? See, dreams and visions that'll change your life. If you know they're from God and you walk in the way that you should go, walk in the way that he's leading you, he will bless your life and your life will forever change. This is the message that we hear from Jacob's rock. The next rock I want to mention is from Numbers chapter 20. This is Moses' rock. This, this rock is crying out a message and testifying that it would never forget. This rock is saying, I'll never forget God's people, as they were coming through the wilderness, this rock says, I remembered hearing how the people murmured and how they said that they wished that they'd never left Egypt because back in Egypt as slaves, they had more and they were cared for better than they were just wandering around through the desert. And this rock cried out and said, the people actually told Moses that they felt like they were, would be happier as slaves to their enemy than to continue on wandering through the desert and dying of thirst. And Moses got so fed up with their griping and complaining that he took his stick and he struck the rock twice. Those that know the story previously, God had instructed him to do that. But this one is significant because God said, I no longer want you to strike the rock, I want you to speak to the rock. And in his frustration, Moses took and struck the rock as he always had, directly disobeying God. And that very act is what kept Moses out of the promised land. The reason that Moses didn't get to go into the promised land was because he had struck the rock. Now God still brought the miracle forth because out of that rock came flowing fresh rivers of water. The water that the people so desperately needed continued to come forth. And this rock is crying out a message to us that we serve a God who will bring a river of living water into your life that will flood the dry places and hydrate the almost dry places. This rock is testifying that the water that God provides, the living water that Jesus said would flow through our bellies, is enough to break the chains of sin and wash away the slave mentality of believers. What do I mean by that? A lot of believers still have the idea, kind of like the children of Israel did when they were in the desert. I've known a lot of Christians who said, you know, I was happier back there in sin. At least I had a life back then. There's a lot of Christians who feel like they're sacrificing something by giving their life to God. And they say, you know what? I had a lot more fun back there being a slave to addiction, being a slave to alcohol, 
being a slave to my old life of sin. And this rock is testifying to us that God brings water that will wash clean the slave mentality and break the chains of sin once and for all in the heart and in the life of every believer. Amen? So that is the second rock that we get a message from. And it's clear. Rivers come from the rock. Who's the rock? Jesus is the rock. The next rock I want to talk about is Joshua's rock. One of the rocks that fell from the walls of Jericho. This rock cries out a message. This rock testifies to us how it saw the praises of God's people. It witnessed firsthand what happens when the people of God begin to lift their voices and shout praises to God. Let's read Joshua 6.20. So the people shouted when the priests blew the trumpets. And it happened when the people heard the sound of the trumpet. Here we go. And the people shouted with a great shout that the wall fell down flat. Then the people went up into that city, every man straight before him, and they took the city. Walls still fall today. I want every believer to hear that. Walls still fall today because believers are known for building walls. We don't build them on the outside. We build them on the inside and we don't tell each other about the walls. We just build these walls inside. And what this rock is crying out to us is that when we are willing to shout praises unto God, that he will bring down every wall in our life. It could be a wall, like I said earlier, a wall of addiction. It could be a wall of a prideful spirit. It could be the wall of unforgiveness in our lives and grudge holding. Whatever the wall may be, when we choose to come to the house of the Lord, shout praises under God, unto God, then the rock will fall. The wall will fall. Can I get an amen on that? Just before the walls of Jericho's fell, the rocks beneath them began to tremble. And they came crashing down. And Leland brought up a point one time that they imploded inward. And I hadn't thought about that. And it's true. And when the walls imploded inward, it created stair steps. So God's people, all they had to do was walk up those steps, walk up those rocks that formerly walls, walk up the rocks and take the victory. God provided it so perfect for them. Here's something that was an impossibility the day before. The people were starting to murmur again, but they continued to follow what Joshua, what God had told Joshua to tell them. They were faithful to God, and because of that, God brought the victory. But can you imagine going back to the camp every night after just circling it and not saying a word seven times or once a day for seven days? God still brings walls down that we build in our life. Sometimes they're walls of resistance to the Holy Spirit. What does that mean? As Christians, sometimes the Holy Spirit tries through conviction to get us to change our path. And when we resist the Holy Spirit, we resist the uh, conviction of the Holy Spirit, we're building a wall. Sometimes we resist what the Holy Spirit is telling us in our heart. Sometimes it's like, well, maybe I need to go and, and pray with this person, or maybe I need to do this or do that. Sometimes we will build up walls because we don't have time in our life. We don't really have time. I don't want to get involved. The enemy tried to get me to build a wall this week with a situation. It's like, Lord, I've got so much going on. How can I jump with both feet into this? And this is the part of the message I was working on when I got that phone call. The enemy will try to get us to build walls, resistance walls that separate us from God and dull the voice of the Holy Spirit. And what this rock is teaching us is that when we choose to praise God, when our lives become true praises, uh, a, a true altar and true praises unto God come from our heart, that's when the walls in our life are going to fall down.
I was looking for rocks. I was going to kind of give you an object, object lesson and I was going to put little eyeballs on rocks and talk about it. But then I thought you might have thought I'd really gone over the bend. But you know, some rocks are smooth. They're called river rocks. And some rocks are jagged and sharp. And it was smooth rocks is the next rock I want to talk about. They were smoothed out from the continually flowing water. This rock in scripture testifies that we need to allow the river of God's living water to flow over us continually to smooth out our rough, rough edges. This particular rock had been stuck into the mud until the hand of the shepherd reached down and pulled it out of the brook. And the shepherd selected five smooth stones because that's what God told him to do. But he would only need one. And the one that he needed was held in the hand of David, the shepherd boy. And it was held firmly in his hand until he released it from his sling and it brought down the giant. And that rock testifies that giants, like walls, still fall in our lives. We may be facing some of the most trying things that we've ever gone through right now as we speak. And God wants us to know the message of this rock is that when we trust God, that giants still <clears throat> fall. Excuse me. Look at 1 Samuel 17, 45. Let's watch what David said to Goliath. Then David said to the Philistine, Goliath, You come to me with a sword, with a spear, and with a javelin, <clears throat> but I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defiled. God wants us to know that the message from this rock is that giants will fall when we take a stand for Jesus Christ in our life. If you remember the story of David, they were at a standoff for days because nobody in God's army wanted to come up against Goliath. And here this little shepherd boy is just coming up to take a message to his older brothers and he sees this standoff and he says, what's going on here? They told him about Goliath. He says, I'll fight him. Why? Because David knew that the battle was not his. It was God's. And that's what David's rock wants us to know. If you want the giant circumstances in your life, if you're facing an enemy, if you're facing circumstances in your life that you think are too big for you to fight, every battle in our life is a spiritual battle. Anything that we will ever face, God has a remedy for. Sometimes God wants us to step back and have peace because we can't change it. Sometimes we'll face giants that we definitely can't battle. And the message from this rock is that when we take a stand and we walk up to that, look the enemy in the eye and say, you have no power over me. This is not my battle against you. This is God's battle. When we do that, God will, will bring the giants in our life crashing to the ground. <clears throat> the next rock is a jagged rock. The message that it's crying out, it's telling us what he saw God do. And he said, this rock was held in the hand where the smooth rock was held by the shepherd boy. This hand was held in the man by the man called Legion. Legion was the man who was demon possessed by multitudes of demons. And he lived among the tombs. And he took this jagged rock and he would cut himself with it. He was so tormented by the demons, he hated the demons, that he tried to harm his body. He tried to harm himself by taking and cutting himself with these jagged stones. This rock would testify how it saw this man over and over try and rid himself of these demons, but he could not. He was depressed. He was embarrassed. But then one day, a Galilean came to shore on, the, on a boat, and his name was Jesus. 
And this rock would testify how he saw Jesus cast out every one of the demons that was living in this man. And when Jesus cast out the demons and they ran into the hogs, this man was so relieved for the first time in years. He had felt truly free. And like we said earlier, those who the sun sets free are free indeed. This man who had been tormented, he's the most demon-possessed man in Scripture. And he fell down at Jesus' feet. And when Jesus cast out the demons, this man began to worship God with all of his heart. He wanted to go with Jesus immediately. He said, let me go with you. And Jesus wouldn't let him go. Let's look at Mark 5, 19. A jagged rock had left scars on this man's body. That jagged rock had drawn blood had cut through the muscle. And what this, this message that this rock is screaming out to us, it's a message for us that no matter what we do, or no, what, no matter what we're up against, there's power in the name of Jesus. Somebody say amen. There's power in the blood of the Lamb, like Brother Vernon sang this morning. It is finished. Mark 5.19, when this man begged, Jesus, to go with him. Jesus said, however, Jesus did not permit him, but said unto him, go home to your friends and tell them what great things the Lord has done for you and how he has had compassion on you. At this moment in his life, this man would have followed Jesus anywhere. He just wanted to be with the man who freed him. But Jesus, and I think partially, he wanted to be with Jesus because he was thankful for what Jesus done. But hear this, I think the other reason was he was ashamed to go back to town and face his friends and his family because of everything that he had done. Because you don't get possessed by a legion of demons all in, one, in the first shot. The Bible says that when you let something back into your life, something demonic, that it'll bring seven of its friends and every time that you allow it back in, the, the pull and the control over your life will be stronger and stronger and stronger. So this, li this man's life speaks of years of mistakes, years of allowing the enemy to take control of him until he had absolutely no control. He had probably uh, uh, asked for forgiveness a hundred times on his decline from his friends and his family. So he was shunned. The Bible says that they were tired of dealing with him and he went off to live by himself among the tombs. And here he is, finally healed. And he's looking at Jesus. And Jesus has got a boat. And that boat can take him the heck out of where he lives. That boat can take him away from having to face his friends and his family. But Jesus said no. How many know that sometimes Jesus says no? And this man, Jesus said, go back and tell them what great things the Lord has done for you and how he has had compassion on you. The message from that jagged rock held in the hand of a demon-possessed man is that God still uses people with scars. So we should never shy away from letting our scars be part of our testimony because Jesus used the most demon possessed man in scripture as I just said to be a witness and to minister to everybody in that region and he'll use you and I the same way when we wear our scars not like a badge there's a lot of people who will wear their scars like a badge of honor like they did something like look what I did Look how I pulled myself out of this hole or pulled my life out of this hole. Look, all, look at all these blessings in my life. Look what I did by all my hard work and, and ingenuity. You know what I'm saying? So we should never wear our, our scars like a badge, but we should allow them to be part of our testimony because God will use them to witness to the awesome power of God. Can I get an amen? There's another rock in John 8. 
when the Pharisees and Jewish leaders had hands full of rocks and they, they came to Jesus and they dragged a woman caught in the middle of adultery and they threw her at Jesus' feet. They had rocks in their hand. And they did this while Jesus is in the middle of teaching. And here's something that I want us to see. They, they brought her and it says they dragged her and threw her in front of Jesus while he's teaching a crowd. And in doing this, what the Pharisees and the Jewish leaders were doing, they were not only trying to trap Jesus within the confines and the boundaries of Jewish law, but because they came to him publicly with other people around, I believe they were also trying to discredit him. And the Bible says that they were trying to trick him. Here's the key. People who are truly seeking healing will come to you privately in love. But people that are seeking a hanging will come to you publicly and they will make their accusations against you publicly. That's what drives me crazy about some of the things I see on the news. Sometimes they accuse people publicly of something and it was found out later they didn't do it. You can't unring a bell. Some of these people's lives are ruined. I have a friend in California that this happened to. Just the accusation is enough to ruin people's lives sometimes. And they were trying publicly to make to trick Jesus because Jesus would have failed no matter what he did in their minds. They had devised this plan. If he doesn't stone this woman, because it was the Jewish law she was breaking, she was caught in the act and there were witnesses. If I don't stone her publicly, then I'm not a godly man. I'm telling the world that God's law doesn't mean anything. But if I do stone her publicly, then I, I have joined with their side and I have said, I have held judgment against this woman. And the Jewish historians say that at that moment when they came to Jesus, they would have handed him a rock, expecting that he would take that rock and join in with them as they publicly stoned this woman. The law was clear. She was caught in adultery. She should be stoned to death for her sexual immorality because it was a crime. They never said anything about the guy. And this rock that, held, that Jesus held in his hand that they expected him to throw at this woman testifies and speaks to us. It says, I remember Jesus Refusing to look at them, refusing to acknowledge them. And in a way, Jesus was kind of writing something in the ground and he was kneeling. See, that's another thing that's part of the Hebrew tradition that spoke volumes because he didn't stand in their presence. He kneeled and he just kind of ignored them. But at one point, he stood up to break the awkward silence. Jesus stood up and he said to them, those of you without sin should cast the first stone. And the Bible says that one by one, from the oldest to the youngest of the Pharisees and the Jewish leaders, they dropped their rocks and they walked away and they left Jesus standing alone with this woman. And he said, neither do I condemn thee. He dropped the rock. He said, go and sin no more. See, the, Jesus chose mercy. He chose not to throw that rock because our Savior, our God, is a rock mover, not a, a rock thrower. Let's look at John 8, 10 to 12. When Jesus had raised himself up and saw no one but the woman, he said to her, woman, where are those accusers of yours? Has no one condemned you? She said, no one, Lord. And Jesus said to her, neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. And then Jesus spoke to them again, saying, I am the light of the world, and he who follows me shall not walk in darkness, but have the light of life. That rock cried out a message and testifies to us that even when your offender is caught in the act of the offense, 
And we've all been offended, amen? Even when you have every right to throw that rock. Even when everybody in church knows that you have the right, that you're the victim and you have the right to throw a rock. Even then, we should choose mercy. And we should choose to drop our rocks. Amen? It's better to give it to God and put our rocks down. Jesus was a rock, not a rock thrower, he's a rock mover. That's the last physical rock I want to talk about, the tomb, the rock in front of the tomb that held Jesus inside. But Jesus on the third day moved that tomb. He moved that rock rather. Even if it's a huge rock, our God opens the door. Jesus can open the door that no man in the world can shut. Just as he can shut the door that no man in the world can open. Our God is all power. Jesus has given that power to you and I through the Holy Spirit. We have all power over the sin, over the enemy, and anything that attacks us. Jesus has given us authority and power over that. Even if it's a huge stone that weighs a ton, even if there are Roman guards placed at it with the orders to shoot anybody who comes near it, even when there's a seal on it from the most powerful government on the planet that, that, that at that time that says, if you touch this rock, you will die. Even then, Jesus moved the rock. Jesus opens doors that no man can shut. And through him, we can all enter in. Jesus is the door. But the most important rock in Scripture, as we close, as we stand, the most important rock in Scripture is the metaphorical rock that Jesus talked about. This is the most important rock in Scripture. When Jesus was gathered with the disciples and he asked them, who do people say that I am? Well, some say that you're Elijah or one of the prophets. And he asked Peter, who do you say that I am? And Peter said, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus said, you are Peter, the rock, Petros, rock. And upon this rock, I will build my church. See, this is where some denominations got it wrong. Jesus wasn't talking about Peter himself. Upon this rock, I will build my church. What is this rock? The knowledge, where, that, the revelation to Peter that said, that told him he knew with every fiber of his being that Jesus was who he said he is. That is the rock of the gospel of Jesus Christ. This is the most important rock in scripture because it's this rock that saves people. It's this rock that'll allow you and I to witness to our friends and family and bring people that we don't even know to Christ. The knowledge of who Jesus is is what brings a person to an altar. You could be sitting in church your whole life and hear all of these great stories and never come to the conclusion in your mind and in your heart that Jesus is who he says he is. Peter declared, you are the son of God. You are the Christ, the son of the living God. Upon that rock, Jesus built his church. And all of us here today are beneficiaries of that knowledge.